There are many stories and themes in the Judeo-Christian Bible for which I feel the evidence is strong that the Bible was influenced by pre-existing religions. And I dedicate several of my videos and video series to that subject. My video numbered 5.1 is called Noah's Ark, a monotheistic version of a polytheistic tale. And it discusses the evidence for why it's highly plausible that the flood myths uh, the flood myth in the Bible was influenced by pre-existing flood myths, and in particular, the flood myth found in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. My video 5.2 is called Satan's Pre-Christian Virgin Birth Stories, and it discusses pre-Christian stories of male gods planting their seeds in virgin maidens. And I call it Satan's Pre-Christian Virgin Birth Stories because I include the apologetic explanations from the early church fathers, Tertullian and Justin Martyr. And they both acknowledge the presence of virgin birth stories that predate the time of Jesus. But they say, well, this wasn't because the Gospels copied the pagan myths. They claimed that Satan pre-plagiarized the Bible. That is, centuries before Jesus came to earth, uh, the devil made something of a preemptive strike by planting these early virgin birth stories in pagan religions in order to trick the public into thinking that Jesus' virgin birth uh, story was just a copy of those pagan tales. All right, moving on. Uh, my video 5.3 is called, God Sacrifices Himself to Appease Himself. Barking Mad? Uh, and I give, it that sub I give it the subtitle of Richard Dawkins Meets Joseph Campbell because the Barking Mad reference is um, what, Richard Do uh, what Richard Dawkins calls the idea of, the sa of Jesus' sacrifice. Given the Christian doctrine that Jesus and God are one, well, this just makes the sacrifice utterly pointless because God is just sacrificing him, himself to himself. And my video then goes on to look at the sacrifice theme from a Joseph Campbell-inspired comparative mythology perspective. Uh, that is, how common it was for ancient humans to associate hardships with the wrath of the gods and how common it was around the world to believe that sacrifice might appease that divine wrath. And there's more, of course, but I'm going to move on to my uh, other two videos on this subject. My video 5.4 is called The Evolution of the Afterlife, and it covers the three stages that the Bible goes through when it comes to its passages on life after death. Stage 1 is 37, uh, the 37 out of 39 Old Testament books that either don't mention or even deny an afterlife. Stage 2 is brief passages in two Old Testament books, and those brief passages say there is an afterlife. Stage three is <clears throat> in the New Testament, which in, uh, of course, the afterlife, complete with Judgment Day and heaven and hell, uh, that becomes one of Christianity's main selling points. Uh, and my last video on this subject, 5.5, had the self-explanatory title of the Zoroastrian Roots of Christianity's Satan. At least that was the title uh, back when I first made the video. All right, now as, for, as far as which specific religions played a part in influencing, influencing the Bible, I cite excerpts from the religious texts and stories from the Sumerians, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, and Zoroastrians. Now, after I made all those videos, I learned, thanks to knowledgeable YouTube commenters, uh, that even though the evidence is solid that Zoroastrianism predates Christianity, we actually have little solid evidence of exactly what Zoroastrian beliefs were in the pre-Christian era, because all the pre-Christian Zoroastrian texts have been lost to history. So, after doing some research to find out if my critics were right, and then finding out that they were, um, I took several steps to correct what I felt was the misinformation I had been spreading at least in this one limited area. Uh, one thing I did was add annotated notes to my videos on the virgin birth and the afterlife, noting that, yes, it was possible that stories about virgin births in Armageddon and Judgment Day and the afterlife appeared in Zoroastrianism in pre-Christian era. Um, still, we don't have the Zoroastrian texts that are old enough to back up that claim. Another thing I did was remake my video 5.5 altogether. I changed the name from the Zoroastrian roots of Christianity Satan to the incoherence of Christianity Satan. And I call it that because I look at the way the character of Satan changes throughout the Bible in a way that's incoherent if you think of Satan as a single character, uh, but it makes sense if you think about the passages about Satan coming from a patchwork of clashing ideas. All right, another thing I did was make a video called Why I'm No Longer Certain About Zoroastrianism's Influence on Christianity. And I'll post links to all those videos in the description box. Now, certain Christian commenters made a much bigger deal out of my confession of this error than I feel was warranted. As if, this is, as if this discovery meant I could no longer say there was any evidence that Christianity borrowed from pre-existing religions. Uh, but that's, that's just not the case. We still have solid evidence that the flood myth in the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh predates the flood myth of the Bible, 
and that the ancient Greek myths of gods planting their seeds inside virgin maidens predates the Christian myth of God planting his seed inside the Virgin Mary, and that stories of Judgment Day and the afterlife are found in Egyptian mythology and Greek literature and mythology long before they appeared in the Bible. So, removing Zoroastrianism from the list of sources that influence the Bible doesn't uh, weaken, doesn't change the argument at all. It's, it's like if you start out claiming you have a dozen witnesses to a certain event and then find out that well, only 11 are reliable, um, that, that still doesn't change anything, doesn't dismiss the case. All right, so the easy part of this discovery and correcting my mistake was everything I've mentioned so far, making the video on why I was no longer certain uh, about Zoroastrianism's influence, uh, remaking the Satan video, adding annotated notes to my videos on virgin births and the afterlife. The more difficult repercussion of this discovery was revising my book, Dialogue with the Christian Proselytizer, which of course contained this mistake as well, given that this book is the basis for just about all my videos. I say that was the more difficult part because revising a book is a cumbersome process that costs money and the rewriting and the reformatting take a lot of time and there are just a lot of other things that I also want to do with my time and money. Uh, but I felt I had to because I spent several years doing research for dialogue with the Christian proselytizer and several more years writing and revising it and it just doesn't feel good to put so much time into something and then just leave it with this glaring flaw. Uh, things like citing Zoroastrian passages that really only date back to the 10th century AD and then claiming that, well, these passages influence the 1st and 2nd uh, century AD New Testament documents. Uh, the section that um, the revision affected the most was my end note on Zoroastrianism. And now just an administrative note here. About three-fourths of my book is a dialogue between a proselytizing apologist and a Socratic skeptic. But when it comes to um, fine historical details, and other kind of commentary that might interfere with the flow of the argument, I put that type of information in the endnotes. Um, and there's about 42 of them altogether, uh, 42 specifically. All right, and these endnotes make up about one-fourth of the book. All right, so now I'm going to read endnote 23 called Zoroastrianism's Possible Influence on the Abrahamic Faiths, or vice versa. Many sources on comparative mythology credit Zoroastrianism as a major influence on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In dialogue with the Christian proselytizers 2006 and 2008 editions, I took the stance as well. Quoting from sources such as Robert Elwood and Barbara McGraw's textbook, Many Peoples, Many Faiths. Uh, here's a quote from the textbook. The influence that Zoroastrianism had upon Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is extremely significant. Among the Zoroastrian contributions are the following. The cosmic conflict between light and darkness, good and evil, as epitomized in the conflict between the good God and his evil counterpart. Eschatology and its emphasis on the end of history, judgment, and a future world. The concept of paradise as a heavenly court and abode of the faithful. Such doctrines as resurrection of the dead, judgment day, archangels, the concept of a coming Messiah, heaven and hell as, in, as incentives to personal accountability, and the restoration of all things in a new heaven and earth did not enter the stream of Semitic slash prophetic religions until after the Babylonian exile. It was after this captivity and the release of the Jews by the Persian king Cyrus that these doctrines first appear in the biblical tradition. All these things were part of the vision of Zoroaster, also known as Zarathustra. Though now few in adherence, the legacy of Zoroastrianism survives in the great monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All right, that's the quote from the textbook. Astute viewers, foremost David Fickert Wilbar, Wilbar, of my internet videos, however, inform me that this conclusion is based on the premise that our extant Zoroastrian texts, which date only to the relatively recent 10th century AD, accurately reflect the pre-biblical Zoroastrian beliefs yet we simply don't have enough evidence, sufficient evidence, to justify that premise. The more I researched the issue, the more I came to agree that it's difficult to know whether Zoroastrianism influenced the Bible, which is possible, given that Zoroastrianism predates the Bible, or the Bible influenced what we know of Zoroastrianism, which is also possible, given, given that all the extant Zoroastrian texts are post-biblical. All right, so now I, uh, my note goes on to cite some sources about the difficulties of knowing the specifics of ancient Zoroastrianism. Um, the first quote is from a uh, book uh, by Mary Boyce called Zoroastrians, Their Religious Beliefs and Practices. Uh, Boyce writes, Zoroastrianism is the most difficult of living faiths to study because of its antiquity, the, vicis uh, the vicissitudes which it has undergone, and the loss through them of many of its holy texts. All right, the next quote is from Solomon Alexander Negotian's 
the Zoroastrian, the Zoroastrian faith, tradition and modern research. All right, Negotian writes, <clears throat> anyone, film, anyone familiar with the Zoroastrian faith must realize the difficulties and uncertainties inherent in the study of its essential aspects. Questions surrounding the contribution of Zoroaster, the spread of his faith, and the development of his teachings and practices are not easy to deal with. In spite of painstakingly scholarly research in the field of Zoroastrian and Iranian ethology, philology, archaeology, and history, there is still hardly any concrete evidence by which one can trace precisely the faith's origin and development. In fact, the ambiguous nature of the linguistic evidence, the lack of a proper philological and exegetical tradition to the Zoroastrian scriptures, the gaps in the historical sources, and the contradictions in the, pre in the existing sources defy a precise historical reconstruction. All right, my last quote is from Eileen Gardner's Hell Online, an interactive tour of the infernal other world. All right, she writes, dating is important for Zoroastrianism because it incorporates many elements which, that may have influenced more flourishing religions, such as Judea Judaism and Christianity, and even Greek and Roman religions. However, even determining the dates for Zoroaster himself and for the era of his religion does not solve the most intractable questions of influence, since there are few early archaeological or textual records. Most of the surviving materials are quite late, and it is impossible to determine with certainty the nature of their originals. We do know that Zoroastrianism went through at least two major transformations. These transformations over time further complicate research into the transmission of ideas from Zoroastrianism. Consequently, very influential ideas about the afterlife, like hell, heaven, individual judgment, resurrection of the dead, and last judgment might originate here, or they might be later borrowings. All right, that's the end of my quotes. All right, on with the end note. Note also that the estimated dates for Zoroaster's life vary wildly. For, exam for example, Solomon Alexander Negotian writes, linguistic evidence places Zoroaster anywhere between 1500 and 1000 BC, while historical and theological evidence dates him anywhere from 900 and 400 BC, while certain instruction, uh, inscriptions related to the Persian dynasty date him from 59, 559 to 522 BC. Mary Boyce writes that the linguistic evidence is the most persuasive, and she writes that it's possible to hazard a reasoned conjecture that Zoroaster lived sometime between 1700 and 1500 BC, and that's from her book Zoroastrians, Their Religious Beliefs and Practices. Negotian, uh, the other writer, uh, concludes otherwise, albeit with similar uncertainty, stating that language is an unreliable basis for dating because people will sometimes intentionally use archaic language with the hope of sounding more authoritative. And of course, we find this in the affected style in the Book of Mormon. All right, Negotian writes, until something better is suggested, the tradition of placing Zoroaster at about the 7th to 6th centuries BC may have to be allowed to stand. And that's from his book, Zoroastrian Faith, Tradition, and Modern Research. All right, so that's my end note. Um, if I were to revise it again today, I might add something to the effect that um, appeals to authority are never perfect proof anyway, especially when it comes to ancient history. But when it comes to things like whether Julius Caesar ever existed or whether Athens ever went to uh, war with Sparta, uh, at least all the subject matter experts have broad areas consensus, and that adds great credibil credibility to their claims. When it comes to the details of pre-Christian Zoroastrian beliefs and even the millennium of Zoroaster's birth, the only thing that the subject matter experts seem to agree on is that, the, uh, is that firm evidence is scarce. All right, now, as I mentioned in this uh, end note, this is the third edition of my book. I published it in 2006, revised it in 2008, and then revised it again in 2010. And both revisions, um, I have to admit, we're based on feedback from YouTube viewers. So I do pay close attention to your comments, and I do greatly appreciate them. Uh, the correction on, of my section on Zoroastrianism is the only change that's been major enough to make a video about, but the corrections in other areas uh, were very important too. Um, it's led me to revise some fine scientific points about astronomy and the origin of life. It's helped me expand sections on comparative mythology, uh, it's inspired me to clarify my position on why I challenge theism more than I challenge deism. Uh, and feedback from Christian viewers has led me to improve the argument of my Christian proselytizer. So, this is my book here. And here's the acknowledgement section, where I mention everyone whose contribution has made a difference. So, to atheists and Christian and pagans alike, I want to thank you for paying close attention to my videos and uh, even continuing to watch them. 
even though I remain a highly irregular presence here on YouTube.